So you brought it up, but I forgot to mention in the beginning, both fathers have young children. So you brought up children now. Our church, I mean, everyone could see you're dressed pretty traditionally. We're a traditional <laughs> church. Both have beards, giant cross, you know. Music and our church. Where is there a place, if any, to bring modern day music or beats or entertainment or anything that's modern for that much into a, such a traditional church? Are you talking liturgical settings or? Both. So start with liturgical and then go into the non-liturgical. So liturgical setting, I'm a firm believer. If nothing is broken, why are you trying to fix it? We received something from the apostles. And those who came before us have handed down to us a method of worship that has led us to be able to reach a point where we have 2,000 years of holy men and women who are saints. The liturgy, I'm just going to say like very bluntly, the liturgy is not about you. Mm. The liturgy is not there to entertain you. This is, so, this is such a, an important but, reality. But Father, sorry, liturgy as a word, it means the work of the people. 100%. And the people now are in 2024. Yes. So where is the room for them to evolve is my question. Name one, name one other church who, when you walk into the liturgical setting, the entire congregation mm. is chanting. We, we have this one month in the, Coptic, in, the, in the Coptic liturgical cycle called Kiyah. Mm -hmm. During the month of Kiyah, the, the entire building will shake because of mm. how many people are praising all together as an act of worship. The work of the people is not to be entertained. It is to worship. Now, you'll even notice that in our church, during the liturgical prayers, even the priest won't look at you. <laughs> the priest is giving you his back. Why? Because it's not about us. It's about us coming together and looking towards God. And so if, if you're coming in hoping to be greeted, hoping to be looked at, to be entertained, to be addressed, other than the sermon, everything else is an invitation to keep your gaze at God. That is your posture. So as far as liturgical goes, no, this is not the place for innovation at all. What about hymns, like in terms of communion hymns and things where people have to come together in worship? Yes. Right? We try to bring our children together. We try to sing, you know, English hymns that they can participate in. Is there at least a vehicle? And I'm not saying we're going to start, you know, bringing a boombox or, <laughs> you know, some MP3 player with, you know, some modern music on it. But is there no vehicle for that? Is there no place for that? If I can add to what Father Anthony said, um, I remember, I can't remember when this was, but maybe two, three years ago, I heard this Protestant youth actually say something that really, really stuck to me. So he was describing his first uh, entrance or entry in, into an Orthodox liturgy, right? So he's com he was comparing his own world as a Protestant Christian, right, versus the Orthodox world. And again, I'm not belittling anybody here. I'm just saying what he said. Um, he was shocked. He was shocked in a good way. So he's like, I'm walking in. I see, like Father Anthony was saying, everybody's looking at Christ, right, or at the altar, right? Seeing all the icons, seeing the incense, right, remembering the book of Revelations, right? Understanding or seeing this made him feel that he was somewhere else. He just stepped into something that is completely different. And that's what liturgy is, right? So when you talk about liturgy, liturgy is the anaphora, right? The lifting up to God, where we are around him, along with the saints, the body of Christ, both those in heaven and those still on earth, united around their God in worship. And that's exactly how you felt. And he was comparing this or contrasting this with his own reality, saying that I feel in the Protestant world, it's different. It's like the world is there and it brought the world in the church. So I, I'm, not, I'm not going up. It, it's the same level. I might be trying to, to make things a bit holier, right? And again, I'm not belittling anybody, right? But, but this was the way he, he saw things. So, like Father Anthony is saying, it is worship and it's worship to God. It's not worshiping ourselves. So it's not about ourselves. So in that context or, or in that light, we should understand and be okay with the fact 
that the liturgical hymnology and the prayers are not done in an earthly way. It's meant to be heavenly. Now, this is a different discussion uh, than language, for example. Of course, I mean, the more, in my opinion at least, the more we understand what it is that we're praising, right? So the more things are in English or in the local language of the country, the better, right? Because we, we raise our hearts to God in true prayer. And we have to get our kids used to this. So I think there is room to play because these rituals and, and these hymns are not a big tea tradition, right? It's not the holy tradition of the church that makes it or breaks it, right? It's not mm. the faith. It's not about this. These are means to get to what is essential. So there is flexibility there. However, the purpose should not that I need to bring the world in the church. It's, I need to go into liturgy go to heaven, participate in heaven. Liturgy is a mystery in itself. Eat God in the Eucharist. Go out and enlighten the world and infuse the life giving God into this world, right? What do you think? Just as a clarification, yeah. though, did not some of our hymnology at one point in time come from the peoples, whether it be pagan or whatever it be at the time, that we wanted to embrace in the church and give them familiarity, almost like a St. Paul to the Roman, I was a Roman kind of thing? Definitely. I think, I think there is something to be said about how historically the, the tunes that we hear were a representation of the culture that the apostles grew in, mm -hmm. right? When St. Mark came to Egypt and he brought the gospel to Egypt, he allowed them to be able to express themselves according to what it is that they knew, right? Now, the church has a responsibility to be able to take what we receive and to be able to deliver it, exactly like Abuna said, especially when it comes to language, in a way that it can be received, dissected, and properly embraced by those who come into the church. Where it gets a little bit difficult here is, I want to go back to something you said originally in the question, Paul. You talked about how it is that our kids and specific beats that they are accustomed to and everything revolved around this idea of what they typically would assign to what is entertaining. Now, to be clear, even at the time of the apostles, there were things that were happening that people can clearly distinguish between what brings about reverence and what brings about entertainment. They were capable of discerning that. What you heard in liturgical prayers, the tones, the tunes, the very movements of the music that is found in liturgy was not the same that you would hear in the marketplaces. Mm. So the idea of bringing what is in the marketplace, again, and this goes back to what Father Gabriel was saying, you're not going to bring what is typically in the marketplace into that place where it is designed for worship and reverence. If we can't distinguish that, then we have a problem. You'll even notice that in the Coptic church, we'll use symbols and triangles. People think we're using them as instruments. And we even have a problem where some deacons will go all out and they'll start using it as if like, you know how when you're playing a guitar, you can go solo really quick and just have your own like moment? No, no the symbols is not used for that. The symbols was actually <laughs> used in a way to be able to keep tempo. It wasn't meant for you to drown out the voices, right? Because again, the whole purpose was to be able to get everybody, the entire body, to focus together on praying these things to God as an act of worship. It was never meant to be entertainment. If we do want, however, outside of liturgical prayers, to have choirs, and in those choirs we're using pianos and violins and guitars and basses, why not? There's nothing wrong with that. And, and this can happen where we allow our kids to also express themselves creatively through music as an offering of praise to God, and at the same time it be done to please their parents who want to come and listen to these beautiful children who have practiced and done these things. There's nothing wrong with that. That cannot and should not necessarily be in, something that infiltrates into the liturgical. Because even the liturgy should not be an opportunity to put our kids on a platform. The only person at the center of the liturgy is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Outside of liturgy, no problem. Can you just define for those who don't know, when you say liturgical services, what does that, what is that defined as? Beginning where, ending where? So when we speak of liturgy, Again, like you said, the word literally just means the works of the people. But when we're talking about the rites and the rituals of the church, we are talking about any formal prayer that the church has created um, a very specific form to be delivered in. So this can be the divine liturgy. 
It could be matins and vespers. It could be the liturgy of the waters. It could be the baptismal prayers. It could be any form of prayer that has a very specific form that has been created and written down into the church as a very specific um, expression of how it is that we pray these specific prayers. Outside of that, though, you have a Sunday school class and they're about to start uh, their, their session and you want to get them into a spiritual setting. You're going to do a few songs of praise. No problem. You want to have the piano present? You want to have the guitar present? Go ahead and do that. Because this is now simply praise. The act of worship and liturgy has to be treated differently.